so you don't need to worry about it. But we're going to start by reading this. So Matthew 27, I'm actually going to start in verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. He cried out, Eli, Eli, lemma Shabbat. You've got to forgive my pronouncement here, right? Shabbat, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on his staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. I'm in verse 49. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. What an awesome scripture. What a powerful scripture. And we're going to kind of focus a little bit on this scripture today. And don't worry, yes, I will talk about the resurrection. So before you, you get nervous, we're going to hit it up for all of you because it's also just as important here. But I want, to, I want to point out something here in this verse. And it goes, at that moment, turn to your neighbor and say, at that moment. <clears throat> at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Have you ever wondered why this was in here? Why all of a sudden we're focused on Jesus on the cross, and all of a sudden the author jumps us all the way back to the city, jumps us all the way back to Jerusalem, jumps us all the way back to the temple, because there is something that's happening here that is important for us to see. Because at that moment, at the moment Jesus gave up his spirit, at the moment he died, something happened. Something shifted. It didn't happen 20 days later. It didn't happen a week later. It didn't happen an hour later. At the very moment he died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the curtain here represents something that's important for you to understand. The curtain here repre represents separation. Because before Jesus died, there was separation between us and the presence of God. There was separation between us and the throne room. You see, there was a curtain or a veil that separated the, what is known as the Holy of Holies. And it separated humanity. It separated us from where the presence of God dwelt, from where the presence of God, from the, where the presence of God was. There was separation. How many of you have ever been separated from something before? Anyone in here? Wow, only some of you. Wow. Um, did anyone go through COVID with me the last few years? <laughs> Just curious right now, right? How many of you have ever been separated from something before? Come on, yeah. I, I want a little, you know, activity here. You got, you got to join me. I'm not just here to put on a show. I'm, I'm here to get you to understand something and grasp something. So I, I think we've all experienced, we've all had something that we were separated from. You know, I don't have a lot of memories from when I was a young, young kid in kindergarten, but I'm going to tell you what, I have a really specific memory, all right? And, you know, I, I was, how many of you seen my child running around? For those of you who know, how many of you seen that little blonde head just booking down the aisles, right? He, he's a really good representation of kind of how I was as a kid. Um, I, I might have actually even been worse, right? Like, I was squirrely, I had a lot of energy, I always wanted to move, and I'm going to tell you something, even back then, I was a talker. Even back then, I could just chat, 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 you know, have this whole conversation with you. And so in kindergarten, they did this thing, and maybe some of you are going to remember this from school, right? Where if you were talking when you weren't supposed to be, when you were like having a conversation with classmates and you were supposed to be keeping it down, right? The teacher would write your name up on the board. Do you remember that, right? So and my teacher, she would write your name and then she would give you a check mark by it. You know, and that's, that's two warnings right there. But she was gracious, so then you would get another check mark right by your name. And then you knew, okay, we're almost there. Like, I, I got to keep this in. I got to keep it quiet. I got to pay attention. And then, as what happened a lot, like I said, I don't have a lot of memories. I remember this happening quite a bit. So it can tell you, tells you something. If you're still talking, if you were still being a distraction, she would circle your name. Right? 
Yeah, and then that, that's when it happened, right? When your name got circled, when you had your name, two check marks, and a circle, it meant you had to miss at least half of recess, which as a kindergartner, I'm going to tell you what, that was, something, that was something powerful to miss right there, right? That hurt a little bit. But you had to miss at least half of recess, and you had to spend re- that, that time you were missing at your desk with your head down. And you had to wait until the bell rang, and then you got the last, like, 10, 15 minutes of recess available for you to go out to. And I can remember sitting down in that room, head on the desk, and hearing the kids having a blast without me. Hearing the celebration just right outside that door. And I knew that as soon as that bell rang, I got to join them. But I was stuck. I was separated from everything that was happening. I was stuck from being able to go and join in on all the fun I was hearing. I want to tell you something this morning. I think some of us might have showed up today feeling separated from everyone else. Maybe you feel separated from just the body of Christ. Maybe you feel separated from all these different people that you actually saw worshiping here today. And you were like, wow, they all are getting to experience something I'm not getting to experience. Maybe you feel separated because you've actually never given your life to the Lord before. And you're just like, I am seeing, I'm hearing what everyone's talking about, but, but I, I, I don't get to partake of that. Sorry, my mic is going a little wonky here. Just give me a second. Maybe you're feeling separated just from the presence of God. You desire to be close to him. You desire to be part of him. But you don't feel like you've ever actually experienced his goodness before, experienced his presence. I want to tell you something this morning, that when he died, I'm going to go back to that scripture, Hannah, right? When he gave up his life upon that cross, it says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Separation ceased to exist. Can I tell you something right now this morning? There is a lie that you are separated from the body of Christ. There is a lie that you do not get to experience the goodness and the love of God. There is a lie that you cannot encounter Jesus because you're not good enough, because you don't have it all together. Whatever you want to say for it, there is a lie for some of you here in this room tonight that is telling you that everyone else gets to encounter the goodness of God except you. Everyone else gets to encounter what God is doing, his kindness, his gentleness. Can you actually just give me the handheld? Except you. I'm going to switch to the handheld. Check, check. Perfect. Except for you. I want to tell you something right now. That separation, that's a lie. And I remember as soon as that bell would ring when I was in my kindergarten class, I would book it out that door. I mean, rubber would burn. I wanted to go, I wanted to partake of what was happening. Because all of a sudden when I realized, when I heard the bell and I realized what was accessible to me, I wouldn't let anything stand in my way. And I'm here to tell you right now, it is accessible to you. In fact, this what's really important as we read this, actually before I jump into that, I'm gonna gonna give you two verses here. Matthew 26, 28 tells us, This is my blood of the covenant. This is Jesus talking. He's doing communion with the disciples before he went on the cross. But he's telling them what is about to happen. And he goes, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 2.24 tells us that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And by the tree, it's referring to the cross. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, we have been healed. Come on, that when he gave up his life, when he died upon that tree, our sins vanished with it. They ceased to exist. And so the very idea of separation also ceased to exist. Because this veil, this curtain, depending on what your Bible says, that hung in the temple. I want to tell you something about it. Because I think sometimes when we say curtain, you think of those curtains that hang up, you know, in your house. Those pretty sheen little things that let some light in, look really nice. That's not what we're talking about, all right? And and even when we're talking about a veil, maybe you think of more like a bride veil. That that ain't what we're talking about either, all right? This veil, this curtain, scholars tell us, was anywhere from probably four to six inches thick. 
as thick as a man's hand, right? It was woven of different colors. It was purple and blue, I mean, sorry, blue and red that met together to form purple with angels inscribed on top of it. It wasn't just this thin little curtain. It was this monstrosity. Can you imagine if something that was four to six inches thick, if I threw that kind of a blanket on you? I'd suffocate you right there and there. You want to talk about weighted blankets, right? They had one. And so this very idea, this very thing that was keeping people back from the presence of God, this very thing that was saying that you have to atone in order to access God's goodness, that you have to atone to access his presence. Because of what you've done, you can't go and see the goodness of God or the presence of God. When he died, it instantly changed at that moment. At that moment, the veil was torn. Hebrews 9, in verse 3, it tells us that behind the second veil was a tabernacle, which is called the most holy place, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which a golden jar holding the manna, which is bread, Aaron's staff, which budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Go to the next one. But in the second room, only the high priest enters once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. This is in Hebrews. The author is talking about what it was like in the temple, what it was like, that it was separate, that once a year, people got access to what God was doing. But then in Isaiah 59, 1 through 2, I'm going to jump to that. It says, behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your wrongdoings have caused a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Here's the thing is we all go through different things in our life that make us feel like we are separated at times. We've all walked through things where we can feel like we're separated from even our family. We feel like we're separated from those who are friends. Maybe we feel like we're separated from God's presence. Maybe we feel like there's a barrier that's blocking us from getting to do what everyone else is doing. You come to church on a Sunday and you see everyone worshiping and praising and you go, I wish I could join in with them. I wish I could have a piece of that. Matthew 27, once again, I'm going to read it, 50 to 51. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. I want to tell you something. It's a lie that you have to live in separation. It's a lie that somehow when Jesus gave up his life, freedom was available for everyone but you. It's a lie that God does not want to encounter you. Your pain and your suffering don't separate you from God. In fact, it's an invitation for him to come closer to you. He's not afraid of your pain. He's not afraid of your hurt. He's not afraid of your fears. He's not afraid of the things that feel like they are clinging to you. In fact, he wants to come closer to you. He wants to pull near. Romans 8, 38 through 39 tells us, For I am convinced that neither death, you don't have the scripture, Hannah, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anyone else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I just I want to encourage you this morning that at that cross, All separation ceases to exist. All right? Your sin does not get to separate you any longer. Because when you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible tells us that you will be saved. So all of a sudden, all of these things that we have in our life, all of these things that we're walking through, everything that tries to tell you, this is driving a wedge between you and the Lord. This is driving a wedge between you and his presence. That is not true. There's nothing blocking you. 
In fact, you now have access to the presence of God. You now have access to come into his presence whenever you want. You now have access to go where he is. Romans 6.23 tells us that for the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So above all, the tearing of the veil at the moment of Jesus' death dramatically symbolized that his sacrifice, the shedding of his blood, was a sufficient atonement for our sins. You see, because the veil in the temple was a physical representation of the separation that existed. It was something God told them to put into place. It physically represented how they could not come into his presence. And God so emphatically wanted to show them that they now had access. It was so important that we grasp that there is no separation, that literally in the middle of this verse about his son dying on the cross, we all of a sudden get a snapshot of what's happening in the temple. And in one verse, we see it all ended in the blink of an eye. But here's the thing. I can have access to something and never use it. Right? I can have access to something and never partake of it. Uh, Maybe you don't believe me. Anyone in here have a gym membership? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Now that got real really quick. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I see all your faces out there right now. I'm going to tell you something, right? I have a gym membership. I did all through COVID, even though my gym was closed all through COVID. I I, I probably have not gone to the gym since my beautiful little three-and-a-half-year-old was born. I think that was probably the last time I went. Right? And then we're about to have a second one. I don't even know what's going to happen now. Like, just praying, right? <laughs> praying. A lot of prayer. A lot of prayer, right? My, my wife was good. She went and got rid of her gym membership probably halfway through COVID because she was like, why are we paying for this and not using it? And I'm like, well, I might use it. <laughs> you know? Like, I, I want the, uh, the availability. I want the option. Because I'm a true American, and Americans love to have options, right? We, we love to have, you know, different choices with us. That's why our suitcases are so big anytime we go anywhere. Because you never know. We want choices. We want options, right? So I, I have been paying for this gym membership for the last three and a half years. I'm going to tell you something. It's bought. It's paid for, right? I have access to it anytime I want. But if I do not go, I'm never going to reap the benefit of what was paid for. Right? God paid the full price on the cross. He gave you full access to his presence. But if you never access, if you never call upon his name, if you never take a moment to allow his presence to come upon you, then you are not accessing what was paid for. You are not accessing what is available. Instead, what you're doing is you're going, I wish I could have this. And he is saying, oh, come on, honey, the door is wide open. I paid for it all. There is nothing separating you. There is nothing that's keeping you away. There is nothing that is preventing you. But sometimes I think we like to let our insecurities make decisions for us. We like to think, well, do do I deserve the price God paid? To use the gym analogy again, and I know I've thought this quite a bit, and maybe you have as well, but sometimes I'm like, well, (laughs) this just cracks me up that I think this, but I do, I truly do. Sometimes I think, you know, if I was in better shape, then I'd be more comfortable going to the gym. (laughs) Have you ever thought that before? Right? Like, I'm, you know... I'm a little embarrassed for the whole world to see me huffing and puffing and trying to climb up that, you know, that whatever it is that I'm trying to do or trying to lift that little bar. If I was more muscular, then I'd be more willing to go and partake of it. Come on. We've all thought stuff like that before, right? But the funny thing is, right, the ironic thing of it is I ain't going to be in better shape if I do not go. So my very, the very insecurity, the very lie I'm believing that somehow I'll access something if I'm in a better place is actually keeping me from being in a better place. So here's what happens is that God goes, hey, my presence is available to you. I am sufficient for you in your weakness. I comfort those who mourn. He tells us all of these amazing things about who he is. And then we go, well, I only feel like I could pray if I hadn't sinned this week. I only feel like I could call upon his name if I had been more faithful. 
I, I didn't worship enough. I didn't read my Bible enough to, to go and call out to God. No, no, see, you're missing the whole point. The, the presence, spending time with him, connecting with God is what empowers you by his spirit to be faithful and to walk in what he's called you to do. Don't let your sins or your failures, don't let your insecurities dictate to you when you get access to God. Because here's the thing, you don't get to decide. You don't get to decide when you have access to the presence. He already made the decision. At that moment, he made the decision for you. That there is nothing that gets to separate you anymore. You know, I think one of the best examples of it, and I don't think you have this verse either, Hannah. I found some of them, not all of them. Is in Luke I'm going to read this, right? Because we know that when Jesus was crucified upon the cross, there were two different people crucified on either side of him, right? There's two people up there. They're called rebels. Um, they're called brigands in some of your Bibles. And it's the same word that's actually used for Barabbas earlier on. And so most likely they were guys who had been with Barabbas or captured with Barabbas. Because if you remember, he was supposed to be sacrificed. I mean, sacrificed. He was supposed to be put on the cross. And then instead they freed him and chose Jesus instead, right? And so there's these two guys on the cross, and we see these polarizing views, these, this different way to look at what's happening. And we have one guy who's railing against Jesus, and then the other guy who originally was railing on Jesus as well suddenly changes what he's doing, changes what he's saying. And in Luke 20, and it's not going to be up there, I don't think, Luke 20, 40 through 42, it goes, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God? seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, surely you will be with me in paradise today. That should challenge us on what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. Because here is a man who is dying. He is not going to get an opportunity to live a better life. He is not going to get an offer opportunity to change his ways. His life is slipping away. But here in this moment, he recognizes that he can call upon Jesus. Here in this moment, he recognizes that he can reach out, that he can admit, I am a sinner. I deserve what is happening to me, but you don't. Remember me. And Jesus tells him that he will be with him in paradise. That should make you even a little uncomfortable, hopefully. Because this man did not go to any worship services. Hadn't probably gone to church in a long time. Most likely had killed people. Most likely had stolen. He did not have his life together. He wasn't a model citizen. I mean, he was hanging on a cross for a reason. It was one of the worst punishments the Romans would do. So here is this man who doesn't have it all together, but he just calls on Jesus. And Jesus answers. Call upon him. Don't let your fears, don't let your insecurities, don't let anything rob you from what is available. So I'm, I'm going to think most of you probably are doing a little better than that man on the cross right now. Yet Jesus was more than willing to respond to him. You see, Jesus wasn't looking for perfection. Jesus wasn't looking for him to go through the five-step program. Jesus wasn't looking for him to have it all together. He was looking for him to believe. And we make it easy sometimes to believe we can be saved, but we don't make it easy sometimes to believe we have access to his presence and his love. We like to put caveats on whether I deserve for God to love me. Anyone ever done that before? I just, 
oh, I wish I could worship, I just feel ashamed. I wish I could stretch out my hands. I wish I could pray, but I, just, I don't think God wants to talk to me. Can you imagine if that was the way me and my wife lived our relationship? Right? Can you imagine that if every time, you know, I, I made a mistake, because she's perfect, right? So can you just imagine if every time I did something wrong, I went, you can't even look at me right now. You can't be near me. I just, I don't even want you to, to talk to me right now. Yeah, right? But we're going to raise children together, and it's going to be great. Can you imagine how that would work? Can you imagine how any relationship in my life would work if I based any level of connection upon my performance? Can you imagine that? It would not be successful. In fact, it would probably drive my wife up a wall. Very, very fast. She just said, oh, yeah, if you didn't hear her. She's sitting up here in the front row, you know. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. I love that. You can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus, because of what he did on the cross. You actually get to walk boldly to him. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done. We have peace with God. You actually have the ability to access his peace whenever you call upon Jesus. So that means that my insecurities, right, but my thought of I can't go, I can't go to Jesus, I can't call upon his name, I can't go into the presence until I have everything together, no longer applies. Because I now get to enter into peace. Peace is my portion. I cannot imagine what it would be like if I felt that same way every time I went to the gym. I'd probably go a lot more. Maybe. You have peace. The crucial element here is this. All this is accomplished by the death of Jesus. A ransom for many, as Matthew 20, 28 tells us, whose blood accomplishes the forgiveness of sins and establishes the new covenant. Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Can I encourage you? that we should never abandon what Jesus paid for by adding anything besides his blood to the access that was given. Don't add something that he did not add. And one of the biggest reasons why, besides the fact it would be very prideful, is that if you add something to what the blood of Jesus paid for, if you add a caveat, if you add an, something ulterior that needs to be done, you're essentially saying, you, you who did not pay the price, you who did not die on the cross, know better than the Son of God. And I never want to do that. But here's the thing, too. Access, there's no separation. We have access. <laughs> but the resurrection leads us into relationship. You see, you can have access to something, but to truly feel like you have authority with your access, there needs to be relationship. 
And the resurrection gives us that relationship. You see, I can give out a key to my house. Actually, me and my wife have given out lots of keys to our houses. Help us, Lord. Right? We're <laughs> Anyone else want a key? Just let me know after service, and I'll, and I'll give you. Yeah, okay, Daniel. Right? So, so Nathan over here has a key to my house, right? right? I do not give someone access to my house. I was being sarcastic in case you were concerned. I do not give someone access to my house if I do not have relationship with them. You see, the level of relationship I have determines the level of access you're given, right? And so here's the thing, right, is that I have, you have access, which automatically predisposes us to the understanding that because you have access, you are also granted relationship. So Nathan has a key to my house. That means I trust Nathan, right? I trust that he ain't going to sell it on eBay. I trust he ain't going to invite you all over and throw a party in my house, right? Like, I, he goes, eh, maybe. You know, he's a youth pastor, so that could, you know, you never know, right? I trust that he is going to be responsible, right, with what I have given him. But, but the thing, too, is that because he has access, I also, it also means that he has the ability to come into my house when I'm not there. And I trust him with that. If he wants to go and raid my fridge, I will not blink twice. And he's like, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> because I, I trust that he is able to do, that he is able to handle what I have given him. You know, here's the thing, right? In the tomb, when we see the tomb, the tomb itself is a picture of separation, right? When you think about what the tomb is in Matthew 27, 51 to 61, it goes, as evening approached, Joseph a rich man from Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. Next slide. And placed it in his own new, new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Marys were sitting there opposite the tomb. You see, th this whole story where we're at, because the story itself is amazing, right? That Jesus died, and at his death, instantly access was granted into his presence. That is an amazing story in and of itself, right? That alone would be something to celebrate. But see, Jesus didn't want you just to have access. He wanted you to have relationship. And so what he does is he takes this amazing story even a step further, and what we see is that resurrection now becomes part of the story. Because Jesus is not dead. Because even though there was a stone rolled in front of the entrance, even though he was dead, not even death got to bring separation. Right? Not even a tomb got to separate him. So not only did he already show us what he's doing in his presence, not only did he rip the veil, and by the way, that, that it says specifically in the Bible, the veil was torn from top to bottom. I love that picture, because most of you don't rip something from bottom to top, except for Wendy out here. I know Wendy does. I learned that. Most of you rip from top to bottom. That very image is almost like God reached down and literally tore the veil apart. But here we have Jesus in the tomb, and it does not end there. Because this is almost like we're looking at another level of separation. But we go further. And in Luke 24, 6 through 7, it talks about how the women were coming to the tomb. And they were terrified. And they, uh, and they said, he is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. Be crucified. And on the third day, be raised again. He didn't just give you access to something. No, no. He, his death secured your forgiveness from sins, and his resurrection secured the relationship he desires to have with you. Because here's the thing. He does not want you to go through life alone. He doesn't want you just not to be separated. He does not want you just to have access. He wants you to know that there is connection available for you. Come on, that you do not have to live this life by yourself. You don't have to live this life all alone. He didn't just die and then just kick you out there and go, I hope you make it. 
No, no, he took it a step further. He decided that even death does not get to cause separation with what the Lord wants to do. Can I just even encourage some of you right now? Some of you are struggling with separation and things that have died. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's even a person. But I want to encourage you that even death does not get to separate you from God. That even death does not get to separate you from what he wants to do. Maybe it's the death of a dream even. That does not get to separate you from the love of God. The story proves it. Access only takes us so far if we don't have relationship with the access. So let's take the example of me giving Nathan a key a little farther. Let's say Nathan did give you a key. Right? Turn to your neighbor. Look at the person who's sitting next to you really quick. I want you to give him a key to your house right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> right? Yeah, oh, yeah, that woke some of you up. Yeah, that, that got you, right? Access only takes us so far if we don't have relationship, right? If you gave that person a key and they walked into your house during your Easter dinner today, some of you would have a heart attack. Some of you would call the police. Some of you would do both. Access is great. Jesus did not just want you to have access. The whole story of the resurrection, the whole story that we read here about him being raised again is because he didn't want you to feel like you did not belong somewhere. He didn't want you to feel like you could come to him and that was it. That you were not welcome. Relationship brings welcoming with the access. So when Nathan comes to my house, I welcome him. I don't scream and kick him out the door and yell, this is my house. I'm happy. I celebrate that he's here. John 16, 7 says, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Because here's the thing. A lot of us know, right, that Jesus did raise from the dead, but then he went away to heaven. But here's the thing. It tells us that it is to your advantage I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So not only does he want us to see that death does not get to separate us, that it does not get to take away from the relationship, he goes a step further and goes, I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to help you. Romans 12, 5, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Not only did he want you to have relationship with him, he connected you to a family, to a body. Jordan, can you come up here? He didn't want you to be alone. I just want you to take a moment and I just want you to think about what is, what do you, that's a better way for me to phrase it, what do you think of separation? Are you feeling separation right now in your heart? Have you believed the lie that somehow you are separated from the presence and the goodness of God? Have you believed the lie that there is somehow something you have to do, there is something you have to earn in order to receive his presence? Because I'm I'm, I'm here to encourage you this morning that there is nothing that gets to separate you, that you have access. And with that access, you have a relationship. Can we stand to our feet? I want to pray for a couple things here just as we kind of close things out. So I'm going to ask just for every eye to be closed and every head to be bowed. And let's not treat this like elementary school where you try to sneak a peek. I'm trusting you here. Eyes closed, heads bowed. And I just want to give the invitation this morning because maybe you are here and you've never actually made Jesus the Lord of your life. 
Maybe you've never actually called upon his name. And maybe you're feeling separated right now. Maybe you're feeling like there is a distance in your life. There's a hole that you're just not able to fill. I want, I want to tell you something this morning, that when you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says definitively that you will be saved. That nothing gets to separate you from his love. Nothing gets to dictate to you how close you get to come to him. So if you are in this room and you've never given your life to the Lord before and you would like to, with every eye closed, every head bowed, can you please just raise your hand and make eye contact with me? There we go. I'm just going to give it a moment and just be brave. Okay. All right, second thing here. If you're in this room and you are feeling, or you have been feeling separated from the Lord's presence, you've given your life to him, you've asked for him to lead, but you are feeling like there is something separating you from his love, I want to pray for you as well. So can you raise your hand as well if that is you? Yeah, thank you. Come on, thank you. All right, you can put your hands down. And finally, maybe you've given your life to the Lord, but you feel like you've gone a different direction. You feel like you've kind of been doing your own thing. You feel like you've been separated from him, maybe through your own choices or maybe just through the stress of life. You go, I have not been walking in the access I know I should have. I've been doing my own thing, and I have not been living for him. And tonight you want to rededicate your, your life this morning, sorry. You want to rededicate your life to him. Can I ask for you two to raise your hand as well? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. you can put your hands down as soon as just awesome. Come on. Prayer teams, can you please come forward to my left and my right here? I'm going to pray that right now, and I want you all just to repeat after me. Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for the price you paid. And I give my life to you. I declare that you are my Lord. You are my Savior. And you are the one who conquered death. And now I'm going to pray for those of you who have been feeling separated right now. So, Lord, right now, we just, I just right now release your Holy Spirit into this room. God, we just release your spirit, your presence into this room. And I just declare for anyone right now who is struggling with feeling separated, God, we release your presence and your anointing upon them. We just speak to the lie that says you have to be perfect. We speak to the lie that says you have to be complete in order to experience the presence of God. And we say, go right now in the name of Jesus. Go right now in the name of Jesus. That nothing gets to separate you from the love of God. And I just make this declaration that his goodness and his mercy and his grace are going to come upon you right now. 